should also add CW number three. Take away Heath. Yeah, Heath is going to Is it working? Oh, yes, we have sound. Good. Welcome. There, every one of the people up here has said, uh, can't see you because there's lights, and it's true. Um, this presentation is on wireless troubleshooting. I've spent uh, just a wee bit of time this year trying to figure out how to troubleshoot wireless lands, and it became a passion, and probably about four months full-time I dedicated just trying to figure out how to do this. But to get started, uh, there's me. I'm going to stop and not talk about troubleshooting for a minute. I'm going to talk about CBRS. No, I'm not pulling a Ben Miller. It's, not, it's just going to take me not even two minutes to talk about. I think CBRS is something that all of us in this room need to talk about. We need to think about. We need to be working on it because we got this. This is ours. Thank you. It's not the cell phone people. When we talk about DAS, that's an expensive, complex, you've got to be an LTE guy to even figure it out. We're talking about little, small cells or microcells or any of that. But when it comes to CBRS, CBRS is ours. If we look at it, this is from the cellular side, and they call things like it's a UE and a CBRS E node B. You're like, what are they talking about? They're not even speaking our language. And yet, if you look at how CBRS is going to be deployed, cell guys can't do it. We got this. Because actually how it works is we have CBRS devices like the phone that you're waiting to pick up when you get home tomorrow. How many of you have a 11 waiting for you when you get home? Yeah. And attaches to an access point. Now, they call it E node B. It's an access point. Unlike all other cell towers and cell equipment, this is a little box about the size of an AP that looks an awful lot like an AP that has a radio inside with an antenna, and it's powered over PoE that connects up to your switch fabric, goes to a switch, and has routed IP over the OSI model. Not at all like the way cellular is. CBRS is ours. So we need to be prepared and think about it. So before I get into troubleshooting, you should be thinking about CBRS because this is not a cell play. This is a wireless LAN play. OK, so first of all, talking about troubleshooting. Wi-Fi is easy to do wrong. Now, why is that true? There's bad fi everywhere. And I'm submitting that the reason there's so much bad fi is because it was programmed to be this way. What's the number one complaint when you're just, I'm, I'm looking for one word. I'll say the sentence, you just together say the answer. Customers complain, they call up and say, the Wi Fi is bad, slow, sucks, whatever you want to fill in the gap. Do you know why? It was programmed that way. So when it actually they call in and say the Wi-Fi is slow. You should go, yes. <laughs> it's doing exactly what it was supposed to do. It was designed that way. And unlike Ethernet, if you take an Ethernet cable and you cross pairs, it doesn't work. And so instantly you have feedback. Oh, that was wrong. You plug it in. You don't get a link light. You look at the cable. Oh, there's a problem. You fix it. Put a new head on. Plug it back in. And you solve it right away. Wi-Fi, on the other hand, when you do it wrong, it still works. It was supposed to. It was designed to be super, super ultra robust, and it is ultra robust. And what happens is if it can't work at the fast speed, it all by itself slows down. Your users don't say the Wi-Fi doesn't work. They say it's slow. It's because it's supposed to be. OK, on to troubleshooting. Tom Carpenter here. Tom wrote a CWAP book a couple years ago. 
had a whole bunch of troubleshooting, had nice, nice little charts like this. The troubleshooting process step, you start out with identify, then you go to here and here, and there was tests that said, oh, you should know these in the right order so you can somehow be a good troubleshooter because you know the order of steps. I don't believe this. I don't think that's how you troubleshoot. The way to troubleshoot is you have to know how it works. If you don't know how it works, it doesn't matter how many steps you take place. So I don't believe this is... Well, one, I don't believe this is wrong. It's a useful structure. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't teach you how to troubleshoot Wi-Fi. So, one of my favorite books. Read it when I was probably early 20s. Read it again in my 30s. Read it again in my 40s. One of my favorite books is called The Goal. And in The Goal, this guy has, it's a story, but it's trying to teach about bottlenecks. And in the story, one of the parts is he's in, in the protagonist in the storyline is trying to solve a problem in a factory, but on the weekend, his kid asks him, please, please, we don't have any scoutmaster to take us camping. Will you take us on a hike? And he goes out with his son and a bunch of other kids, and they're hiking backpacks on. And what they realized was, he said, we all are going to get to the campsite at the same time. And there was one big kind of overweight guy with a really super big pack because he had lots of food in cans and he's backpacking and he's slow. And what he said was everyone has to show up at the same time. And after a while, this other boys realized, well, if we take Gordo's pack off of him, he could walk faster so we can all get to the lake sooner so we can all go swimming. And they did everything they could to speed up Gordo. And the guy realized, wait, in my factory... What's my bottleneck? I should do everything I can to fix the bottleneck, and if I fix the bottleneck, that will make the entire factory go faster. And then as soon as you find one bottleneck and you fix it, well, there's another bottleneck and you fix that. So anyway, this goal is teaching about how do we fix bottlenecks. And in server world, when I started, it was a Cisco Ace before, and it was about servers, you wanted to fix the bottleneck. If you don't know what the bottleneck is, you fake it. You just add more RAM. And you could just put, keep adding RAM, and it would mask any bottleneck. In networking, you have a bottleneck, just throw more bandwidth at it. And you, but you didn't actually fix anything. So what we need to do is figure out, how does wireless fail? And then we can learn to fix it. So this is a, sorry, Lee. It was 2016. Lee Badman made this little napkin. And it said it was soon to be famous. It's taken three years, but it's now famous because it's up on a slide and a conference, and he was going through saying, what are all the things that could go wrong with Wi-Fi? You have your access point, and the clients talk there, and there's users behind that, and they talk over to a switch, and the switch talks here. He was trying to explain to his bosses and his customers at the university he works at, how do you find where in this thing could be a problem? And there's lots and lots of places to have a problem. So when I started this journey this year on coming up with a new way to troubleshoot, I started with this picture. But found it wasn't robust enough. Okay, so is troubleshooting Wi-Fi a problem on the left or a problem on the right? So on the left is Occam's razor. Occam was a priest like hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And what he said was, more things should not be used than are necessary. Now, he actually said it in Latin, so I don't think, I mean, put the Latin down, but I didn't think you'd get it. Basically, the simplest answer is probably the right answer. That's Occam's razor. So when we have Wi-Fi, should we just say the simple answer is the answer, and what happens is a lot of people then go, bad Wi-Fi, put up another AP. Problem solved, simple. Or on the right side, you have a simple, yet wrong, and everyone's going down that path. Or you have a very complex, but no one's going down that path. I chose the right. So here is what, where the complexity ended. Starting back with Lee Badman's chart, this is what I ended up with. Here's a chart. I took This is four months of my life on this little page here. And many, many, many conversations with lots of people. On the left side in the red are all the things that could go wrong with wireless. 
The blue in the middle are the things that can go wrong with the LAN. The stuff on the right are the things that can go wrong with the WAN. And any one of these bubbles, and there happens to be 36 bubbles, any one of the 36 bubbles could have a problem. Now, some of these bubbles are loops, and they go really, really fast. Like, we'll just pick one bubble. Uh, there's kind of a red light box you can kind of see on the left side called the RF medium. And in the RF medium, one of the little bubbles is for every single transmission over the RF medium, there is a decision that makes. There is AFES, or old time we called it DIFFS. And then there's slot times, and we count down a random slot time. And then whoever wins will transmit. And when they transmit, they transmit, and then there's a SIFS act, and then the cycle happens again. So for every single transmission, there's this little teeny thing called, I put it on there, called the contention process with a little loop, and it's going on really, really fast at the microsecond, millionth of a second level. The one to the right of that says MCS process. For every single frame that gets transmitted, the transmitter is making a decision. How should I package the payload? Now, the payload's pretty easy. It came down from the protocol stack. But when it gets down to the NIC, it's saying, hmm, whether it's AP or client, doesn't matter. Every time I'm going to transmit across the medium, I have to make this decision. I'm sending it to this device. I need source address, destination, transmitter, receiver, all that. But I also have to package it. Preamble send at BPSK. I have a header. I have a frame body. And on that frame body, how am I going to process it? Am I going to send it out with BPSK or QPSK or 16 qualm or 64 qualm? Am I going to go 5 of 6 coding or 3 of 4 coding or 1 of 2 coding? I'm going to go 20 megahertz channel or 40 megahertz channel. I'm going to have short guard interval on or long guard interval on. All of those decisions have to be make made before I put it on the RF medium, which then needs to use the other little button to say, is it my turn to talk? So there's a little teeny cycle for, is it my turn to talk? There's a separate cycle for which MCS am I going to pick? There's overhead. We're going to see a slide later about this. So every one of these is either a fixed thing. It could be a service, DHCP, DNS. And each one of these bubbles have processes. Some of them are cyclical. Some are fixed, some are periodic. Every 90 seconds do this. And if I took each one of the bubbles and said, what could go wrong in that bubble, we came up with another list. So for each one of the bubbles, we have a line. And inside the line are the things that might possibly go wrong on that line. What kind of questions do you want to do? So 36 bubbles, uh, about 427 lines, and this isn't really complete. And people go, yeah, you're going to troubleshoot the Wi-Fi? Where? Which one of these am I going to have to do? So realizing the troubleshooting Wi-Fi is not a simple thing. It's extremely complex. It has lots and lots of components. And if you don't know what they are, you're going to make a mistake by saying, well, I, I need to add an AP. Well, is that, where, where in this picture is adding an AP solving something? There's only one bubble up here that even has to do with that. So by adding an AP or turning off long guard interval, or setting your MCS basic minimum rate, what's that going to do to this entire process? So first, we have to understand how Wi-Fi is transmitted RF medium, how it affects the LAN, how it affects the WAN, and understand it before we can figure it out. So we need to have tools. We're humans. We make tools. We use tools. We tied a stone to a piece of stick so we could turn it into an axe. Well, we're not quite that bad. We need tools for us today. Now, in wireless, we don't quite use screwdrivers and scissors and hammers and those kind of things. Well, not too much. But what we do need is tools to help us answer the previous question. Of the 427 issues, what is it? You know what? I can't see RF. Can any of you? That's what those were for. I knew they had some reason when I had them. Even Jordy LaForge may be good with his visor, you know. I've wanted one of those really bad. Um, so we need to have tools that will help us do our job. As humans, we can't touch, taste, smell, hear, feel radio waves. So we have to have something that's going to help us in between. 
So let's talk about our tools. Well, I went looking at tools, and I first thought, let's put them into some categories. We have free tools, yay! We have low-cost tools that anybody could pick up and buy. And then we have professional-level tools that cost some money, but they give us something. At home, my wife has a little, very nice, pretty, purple bag of her tools. And all of her tools have purple handles. And she's very, they're her tools. I can't use them because they're girl tools. But they're real tools, and they work, but they're hers. Well, what tools are we going to use? It's not, the categories aren't free, low-cost, and professional. They're, how do I use a tool to look at the problem? So instead of looking at the problem as a flow, this was a flow. We, we're not going to look at it as a flow. I want to see it a different way. So I took and said, for our tools, we, at the center of this entire diagram, are requirements. A couple of people have said it already. Keith says requirements all the time. Yep, I do. And I'm going to say it again. What are your requirements? Could I guess get the house lights on for a minute so I can see the audience? You're supposed to be listening back there. Can I get the house lights on? Larry. Larry, house lights. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Now that I can see you, ready? How many of you, actually, everyone stand up. Stay standing if you can tell me the following pieces of information for your network. Ready? Sit down if any one of these you do not know and you could write down right now. The RSSI minimum requirement. Yeah, you're standing up. The secondary RSSI. The coach channel interference that you've designed your network to. The SNR that you have as your requirement. The data rates that you need. The PoE requirements that you have for your APs. How many of you standing are also CWNEs? I think there's a high ratio there. Thank you. You have to know your requirements. If you don't know your requirements, how do you possibly think you can make it work? So the center, the core of this are the requirements. You need to know what they are. And I just gave you a short list. There's actually a much, much longer list of requirements. I could have asked, do you know what your LCMI is, your least capable, most important device is? How many of them? What are their data rates? What, at, at what point does the client roam? If you don't know that, how do you design it so the client can do its roaming? Okay. And then I came out and said, you know what? I go about my troubleshooting different than other people do. If I was asking Peter McKenzie. Peter McKenzie would come over here from the uh, interrogate side, and he would whip out of his favorite tool is OmniPeak, and no matter what the problem is, he has a hammer. And everything looks like a nail. And his hammer is OmniPeak, so he goes about it, pack it. I'm a ACAO guy. I come on and I get a, a call to do troubleshooting. I come in through the validate. I'm going to use survey software to tell me, is the RF where it's supposed to be? We have lots of different tools we can use, and it's not a flow. It's you come in with the tool you have. You get as much information as you can find. If you need more information, you shift and get a different tool. Some of us start up in the investigate tool on the right side. We use Adrian's, uh, Adrian Granadosa's Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. You fire it up. You look and you see kind of a tabular way of looking at the data. That's a totally valid way to start troubleshooting. But when you run into a problem, what's the next tool you're going to use? So we have investigate tools that have usually fairly inexpensive tools there. We have measurement tools for doing throughput testing, iperf, jperf, zap, uh, uh, eperf if you're at our place. We have validation tools for doing the software. We have spectrum analysis tools for looking at the spectrum. We have interrogation tools for doing packet analysis. And the top one for manage 
are people who all they have is their controller. And they go, well, I have my controller, so I can come in and see everything from the controller standpoint. And any one of these is a valid way to go about and say, hey, I can use this to solve my problem. Just realize the goal is the requirements in the center. Okay. So let's look back at this little picture for a second. And we're going to go through this little flow, starting with the RF medium. Now, the RF medium is this little box. I kind of zoomed in. See where the box is? I kind of zoomed into that box. So inside the RF medium, here's the things we might have to worry about. From adjacent channel inference to average data rates to average MCS to what's the channel occupancy, what regulatory domain are you in, what retry rates are you in. All of these things are extremely important because nothing in the RF domain is, is unaffected by these issues. Some of the things you're trying to troubleshoot need special pieces like jitter. I'm doing a bit torrent, I probably don't care a lot about jitter. I'm doing a voice over IP call, I probably care a lot about jitter. So I'm not saying all of these are all the time. Some of the people can do, no. But we have to think about how this works. So let's zoom in a little more, and we'll look at just the contention process. Just the contention process in the RF medium box that's in the entire wireless site. So zooming down to contention process. How does any individual transmitter, could be an AP, could be a client, doesn't matter, they're all using the same frequency. How does an individual actually access the RF medium? Now in ECSE classes, we call this the game. Because we get little dice, we pass the dice around, people roll dice trying to figure out. Because there's a randomness to it to say, how does each device access the medium and we have it so they don't do it at the same time. In Ethernet, Ethernet has a random back off timer, but it doesn't trigger until after there's a collision. We have a collision, then we have a random back off timer. In wireless, we have a random back off timer in front of every single frame. How does that work? You need to understand how that works. We have preamble detect, we have energy detect, there's a ticks op that comes out because of that. There's a wait time, random slots, countdown to zero, I win, I transmit, and then the entire, entire cycle starts all over again. There's a great CWMP. Anybody remember when that came out? Like 2014 or maybe 2010? It's been around a long time. On this contention process, that's where the, the bottom right cycle goes. You need to understand how this works. Every single transmission uses it. If you're trying to troubleshoot Wi-Fi, you kind of need to know how Wi-Fi is going to be doing its work. Upper right-hand corner is the picture of the bubble, so you can tell where we are. Next one up, MCS process. How does a single client, AP, by the way, whenever I say client or AP, you, you can interchange them. It's something that's going to use the medium and transmit across the RF medium, doesn't matter if it's an AP or a client. They have to make a decision on how am I going to package the next set of bits. Modulation, coding, channel width, short guard interval, the more SNR I have, the better capable I should be in order to deliver a higher modulation. If I have higher modulation, I have higher data rates. I have higher data rates, I use less time. You know what the secret is for high density? Fast. You want to go with lots of people in a room, they all have to talk fast. In order for them all to talk fast, you have to give them lots of SNR. You give them lots of SNR, your noise floor climbs up, and my S is your N. Yeah, that's why we get paid the big bucks, because this isn't easy stuff. There's no simple answer to it. So we get to this, MCS chart. I am not Devin Aiken. Where's Devin? He's, can't see him. Anyway, Devin has this memorized. I do not. I tested him on it once, and he had it memorized. I carry it around with me, I laminate it, take it with me, because this chart tells you about everything. Now think about this. If you were a client, or an AP, and you wanted to send a frame on the medium at the moment, the choice of coding, spatial streams, modulation, channel width, and guard interval, self-diagnose. 
If I know your MCS, I know how happy you are. I want to figure out what the RF environment is around you. I just ask you, hey, Martin, how's your MCS right now? And you will tell me. If you ask an AP, oh, how's that guy's client over there, number one, two, three, four? The AP will say, well, the last time I talked to him, I used this MCS. You know about the health of the RF between those two because MCS dynamically finds the best sweet spot at the moment. It's in one of those little loops. So if I want to figure out what's going on on the RF, I just ask a device, what's your MCS? Now, if I care about the whole frequency, a channel, a band, an SSID, I can just ask a question and say, oh, what is the average MCS on channel six? The answer will tell me about the health of channel six because every single device who's using that channel is self-diagnosing and making a decision dynamically to find out what's the best MCS at the moment. I love this chart. I use it all the time because it tells me about it. Now, uh, Windows people in the room, how do you find out what your MCS is? Buy a Mac. Yes. <laughs> it is that simple. If you're a Windows user and you're in Wi-Fi, buy a Mac. I'm not joking. When someone on Windows can tell me what their MCS is, I will then maybe change my mind. But the reason so many when Wi-Fi people use Macs around the world, higher ratio than anywhere else, is because Mac will show you the MCS in real time what you're getting. Now, there's ways to reverse engineer it, kind of. Um, Seven Signal mentioned yesterday in one of their things that they're going to have MCS on Windows, like in a couple quarters. They're working like full time with developers working at it to come up with this little teeny piece of information that's just sitting out there saying, yeah, I made this decision. Okay, so that was the top half. And there's on this top half of this box, the RF medium, there's a bunch of stuff going on. I didn't touch on DFS. It's also a thing. But let's go down to the next box below and say, how does a client join the network? Now, you know, this one has a little loopy thing around association because association process is a loopy thing. It cycles through. Some clients do it every 90 seconds, every 60 seconds. Jerome Henry had some good presentations at Cisco Live where the, he shows, you can actually see the pattern of different clients, how often they go through this. And association isn't just association. It has to do with roaming, it has to do with all sorts of things. So from the association little bubble, if we pass it, and we get past that, we then go to the authentication line, open, pre-shared key, or radius. And if we pass that, we go to the encryption column, encryption, TKIP, or AES. Uh, you see that TKIP is deprecated. It's still there. It still works, but you shouldn't be using it. And then we hit a control port, and the control port works. We get upper layers. Upper layers, DNS, DHCP, all those uh, issues. And then we finally get to talk to their AP. There's this entire process going on here. It has to do with roaming, it has to do with joining, it has to do with everything, and you kind of need to figure out how it works. So first one up, I call this a green diamond. I've been calling it a green diamond for nearly 20 years because my first graphic artist I had make this little picture on the left side, which is 19 years old, that picture, has not changed in 19 years. We used up purple and red on the top, so the bottom diamond became green, so I've called it the green diamond. Green diamond is a shorthand words for what is the algorithm of making a decision of which API I should join. Note it's in the green diamond is in the laptop, which also tells you how long ago it was. It had a PC card slot. It hasn't changed. It's still up to the client to make the decision, and it's going to make its decision on SSID on RSSI, on SNR. In our classes, we do this th little game and say, okay, you're a client, you just received 17 probe responses, how do you choose which AP to join? And then the next person has to do it, but you can't use the first person's answer. And you could go 30 people in the room, and there's more than 30 ways of making a decision about which AP I should join. Now, some of them are public. They're all highly proprietary. Some of them are hidden, like, uh, what's my current GPS location? 
And the last time I was at this GPS location, which AP did I end up with that gave me the highest MCS overall? There's heuristics built into some of these. Are you, was the AP that I was on last time? Did he treat me bad? I'm not going to go back to him because he was a very mean AP. It's not a simple who's, well, okay, not for everyone. Vocera, SSID, SNR, done. That's their algorithm. If you know how that works and you're designing, you can design to make Voceras nice. If you have Apples, if you have iPhones, if you have Android phones, if you have desktops, whatever you have, they have different green diamonds. Some of them are very complex. Some of them aren't. But how do you know how to troubleshoot unless you know what those processes are? And since these are highly proprietary, it's not, you just can't go look it up and say, oh, Galaxy S10, what is its green diamond, and where is its trigger point for if I'm home or work? There's even little variables like stickiness. Now, we call it stickiness. The vendors call it loyalty. <laughs> if I'm on an AP and I move away, should I stay on the first AP or run to the second AP? Well, the problem was, almost 20 years ago, we had something called flapping, where you had two APs in a conference room because you wanted really good coverage, and then the client would sit there and go, I love you, Bob, I love you, Bill, I love you, Bob, I love you, Bill, and it would flap. So to ruin, to get rid of flapping, vendors added loyalty. <laughs> so that it would say, I love you, Bill, and stay there, even though Bill, Bob got a little better. So we wanted to add that. Now, sticky is a good thing or a bad thing? Where's Sam? It depends, of course. If you were designing an Apple TV, would you want high sticky or low sticky? High sticky, it doesn't move. If your neighbor next door got a new Nighthawk super duper or whatever with those, you know, spider, you don't want your Apple TV moving, so you want it really sticky. But on iPhone, you'd like it to be sticky. So we understand why every vendor has a different green diamond to make their decisions. Association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. Thank you. Oh. You need to memorize this, man. If you have a link light, do you troubleshoot up the stack or down the stack? Okay, I'll put that in the form of a question. If you have a link light, do you troubleshoot up the stack or down the stack? Uh, why don't you troubleshoot down? Because you got the link light. If you're associated, do you troubleshoot up the stack or down the stack? So why are you adding another AP when someone gets an association? That's down the stack. You need to know where the processes are. All I have to do is say, if you're associated, I don't have a wireless problem. I might have other problems. It might not be working. But the client associated. That means the client made a decision between multiple APs, made an answer, sent off an association request, got back an association response, and is now associated. You have a link light. Another way of looking at this, this is just kind of a simplified, it, it, I didn't use the little red bubbles this time, just we're going to go from the 802.11, and after we're associated, we then authenticate. After we authenticate, we encrypt. And after we encrypt, we get a port control. And then we go and get upper layers. And then after the upper layers, we get LAN access to the things that are on the LAN. And then we get a captive portal. Where in this whole process can you see on a client's device? Can you see a client is associated on your phone? Anders, can you see if your phone's associated? Really? What do you, when you said that, what did you see? And you get the little boing, boing, boing thing? You know, doing, doing. I don't know, whatever you call that little logo. I just call it the boing, boing, boing. But what if you get a boing, boing, boing with an exclamation point in the middle of it? Are you associated? If you are associated and you get an APIPA address, one of those 169 addresses, is wireless working? Yes. 
How do you know wireless is working? Because you never get an APIPA address until you make a DHCP request and fail, and then you get a 169. So in order to even trigger the DHCP, you had to be associated. So when your users say, oh, I have a captive portal, the Wi-Fi is not working, they're lying. <laughs> if you have a captive portal, how did it get on their screen over the wireless? And then we get to the upper layers. VLAN, DHCP, SubNMS, DNS, and the last step is Captive Portal. Now, when we get to Captive Portal, there is a bunch more troubleshooting to do. Here's a whole flow chart of just the Captive Portal troubleshooting part. How many of you know your way through that right side? I don't. How many of you even know what a, oh, I forget even the term, a Captive Portal mini browser is? And when is it triggered? And what's the thing on your phone that makes the Captive Portal mini browser work? And does your phone have one? Or do you use a different version for the Captive Portal trigger? And our users out there, yeah, the Wi-Fi sucks. Yeah, and it, did you get a Captive Portal? Yes. Well, then it's not a Wi-Fi problem. It's kind of like people saying, yeah, my, you know, BitTorrent's really slow. I think I have a bad Ethernet cable. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Another one, I, I, I love charts with nice color things. And this one is, we got so many channels to choose from in 5 gig. Which one are you going to use? Are you going to use big ones or small ones? Now, I ask this question all the time. And people ask me, and I answer, same answer. Should you use a 20, a 40, an 80, or a 160? What's the answer? As, perfect, Martin. I love it. As high as you can until you can't. How do you know when you can't? When you get co-channel interference. So I love 160s. I can't have very many of them, but I, that 160 is going to give me faster throughput. Mike Albano has a great site. You can go and see what channels if they DFS, DFS channels they support and whether or not they support 40s or 80s and all that. It's great information, but the answer is wide ones are better than narrow ones until you get co-channel interference. And then you have two APs sharing a 40 megahertz channel have less throughput than two APs not sharing a 20s. So just think through it. DFS channels. We are not the primary user in those channels. I'm not going to go through all the little details here. There's processes. I will just say, airport does not equal DFS. I don't know how many people go, yeah, we turned them off because we're near an airport. Why? Well, because we're near an airport. Why? Well, because airports cause DFS problems. Really? Talk to Jim Palmer. Who's on an airport? Talk to Aruba Stadium that's right in the line of sight from the San Jose airport. And do you know where they get their DFS events? On the opposite side. There are false positives. But airport does not mean you have DFS problems. Next. And this is a pretty big, important one. I borrowed these slides from uh, VRD from Aruba. Let's just walk through a single frame, one frame. So, ready? I want to transmit. So I'm going to play the game, and I'm going to grab an AFES, depending on my QoS category, my WMM category. It's this big, however the size it is. And then I'll have a contention window, which could be 0 to 31, 0 to 5, 0 to 7, zero, some number. And I will count down those slot times. And when I win, after all that process, the entire time I'm listening to make sure there's no preamble detect, there's no energy detect. And then I win. It's my turn. Woo I won. So I send a preamble. Preamble goes out at BPSK. Then I send an RTS. The RTS is packaged. It's not a very big payload. But it also has a preamble, a header, and then a little teeny payload. And then there's another SIFS. And then there's an preamble, and then a CTS, and then another slow preamble, and then a fast preamble, and then a header, and then I finally get to my payload. And that's the only one that's going to go at my fire rate. 
of the color up above, only the blue is payload. What are all the other colors? Overhead. We're rocking the overhead, guys. So when people go, yeah, I want to I go really fast. I want to go not 300 meg. I want to go 600 meg. Really? You made the little blue thing go a little bit smaller. All the rest is still there. What gives me hope, though, is of this extremely heavily weighted toward overhead model that we live in in Wi-Fi. In 6 gig, we don't have to be backward compatible anymore. What gives me hope, and why I said, CBRS, we got this. CBRS doesn't use our antiquated, old, very inefficient method of putting payload on a network. They're way better in LTE at doing spectrum management. And all of this to deliver one payload. This is not an efficient thing. No one's ever claimed Wi-Fi was efficient. It's free, though, and it's on all your devices. So there's a whole bunch of upper layer protocols we don't need. So when we look at this issues, every one of these little bubbles is a place you could troubleshoot. Let's move over and look at the next category, all the things that could go wrong on the land. By the way, if any of these are wrong, is it a wireless problem? It's a perception of a wireless problem because if our main number one way of accessing the network is via wireless and the, wire, and the network has a problem, ooh, it's a wireless problem. But we need to know the difference so we can fix them because if we think it's a wireless problem and it's really a wired problem, all the things we do over in wireless aren't going to make it go away. It's like you take your car into the mechanic and go, yeah, I think there's something wrong with my air conditioner. And he changes your oil. You're like, there you go, 70 bucks. My air conditioner doesn't work. I know, but I changed your oil. Because why? Because you brought it to an oil chain shop. <laughs> go to the right place when you want to fix something. So how did we make cable go faster? On the left side, silver satin. Couldn't even do data very well. We got twisted pair, cat three, cat five, cat six. We went from one meg data rate to one gig data rate. We made, we made cable go 1,000 times faster. Did we change the copper? Did we change the length? Did we change the speed of light? How did we make the same copper at the same length using the same speed go 1,000 times faster? Lowered interference. How do we make Wi-Fi go faster? Got it in one. Lower interference. It's the same thing. I am not going to go through all of these. But you need to. You need to understand them and realize every one of these little bubbles has issues. You need to understand where DHCP comes in, why it comes in, how you made the request. Understand that if I send a DHCP request out on a flat network that has, I don't know, 22,000 people in a stadium and they're all in one broadcast domain and your DHCP server only has a slash 24, you might have a broadcast storm that looks like a wireless broadcast storm because all of the clients keep asking for DHCP and nobody's giving them an answer, so they keep broadcasting. And it is a broadcast storm in the wireless, but it really didn't have anything to do with Wi-Fi. Wi okay. How do you tell, is it a wired or wireless problem? Here is an example from, I was in Dubai at a very special place. It was called the Silicon Oasis. In Utah, we have something called Silicon Slopes, and there's Silicon Valley, and there's Silicon whatevers. This was Silicon Oasis, and it was a brand new hotel, and they put in the best Wi-Fi they could afford at the time, and they were so proud of it. And so, down below, is what I was getting. So you can see down below, I had excellent from Adrian's tool. I was on the Premier Guest Network with Extreme. I was getting an 867. Now, I was on a MacBook. I could have did a 1.3 gig, but the AP only supported 867, but I was as fast as I could go, getting a 9 MCS index, meaning I was sending at short guard interval, 
506 coding, 256 qualm, and I was transmitting over an 80 megahertz wide channel at 866 megabits, and I did a speed test and got one meg. So I went down to the front desk, and I went to complain, and they said, not another one. Are you complaining about wireless? No, I'm complaining about your backhaul. And they went, what? I said, what is the internet connection you have in here? Your wireless, by the way, is really good. They said, yeah, we spent a lot of money. I said, but what's your backhaul? Uh, we have, and proudly said, we have an E1. <laughs> now, for those of you in the U.S., it's like a super T1. Instead of 1.5, it's 2.1. So it's like a really good T1. And they were proud, like, and that's your problem. So what is it? Right here in this room right now, I'm currently connected to CWMP 19 and 5 gigahertz to an ACAP that's offering 289, and I'm getting 260, oh, 234, I'm MCS, oh, they're pretty good. 260 MCS 9, I've got 29 SNR, and I'm pulling down 5 meg. Do I have a wireless problem? But yesterday when I complained to the network people they, here, they said, no, 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 we have, we have like a full gig out to the internet. You might, but we don't. Why are you throttling us? And they're like, well, being, a, being a, that it's this hotel, they're a little gun shy, so. <laughs> Just saying. So how do you tell, is it wired or wireless? Kind of important piece of information. It's like the whole trigger on troubleshooting, which, do I go to the red box or the blue and green box? So how do you tell? Wired issues have certain issues. Wireless have different issues. And you need to be able to quickly make those decisions. Or you'll be tracking something down for a long time down the wrong path understand the difference between these two, it actually makes a big difference. And I just realized I should make the wireless issues red because <laughs> it matches the other picture. Okay. So when you have a wireless or wired problem, here's a very simple way to go about it. Do I have an IP address in my wireless? Yes, you don't have a wireless problem. Because how did it get to you? Got to you over wireless. Now, I'm not saying the wireless is fast. I'm saying it's not a wireless problem because wireless is working. Can I ping the Wi-Fi client from the wired side? If I can, that means from the wired side, I send a packet frame over the network to an AP who sent it over the air, who went to a client who heard it over there, who sent it back to me, I don't have a wireless problem. Now, the client might complain, there might be another problem, but I don't have a wireless problem. If I want to know about the health of the RF, Ping's not going to tell me anything about it. I did this experiment once, and it's going to sound, I'll try to speed it up, but it went kind of, kind of like this. Sent a ping down to a NIC. The NIC turns around, packages it up with 256 QAM, 506 coding, 80 megahertz wide channel, short guard interval, packages it up, sends the data frame. No act. Sends the data frame. No act. Send. No act. Send no act. And now the green diamond in the client says, hmm, I tried sending this ping payload with that modulation. It didn't work. Maybe I should change my modulation. Now, the reason it tried it over and over is because the first cycle through, it's saying, I think it could be congestion on the network, on the, on the frequency. So and when I send it and I get a retry, my back half timer gets a bigger contention window. So I'm adding more randomness. So if it is contention, maybe adding more randomness will make it go away. So it goes ping, no ack. Double up my contention window, ping, no ack. Double it up again. I might get up to, I don't know, 512 slot times, which is a whole lot of delay with nothing going on, in order to say, I don't think it's contention. I've given it the best shot. So then the Nick goes, okay, this time I'm going to try something different. I'm going to make it go to 64 qualm. Repackage the whole thing. Try it again. Ping, no act, ping, no act, ping, no act, ping, no act. Huh, that didn't work. 
Maybe it wasn't the modulation, maybe it was the coding rate. So I'll keep the same 64 qualm, but I'll change the coding rate from 5 of 6 to 3 of 4. Ping, noack, ping, noack, ping, noack. Huh. Maybe it was the 80 megahertz wide channel, because 80 megahertz wide channels have 6 dB less SNR than a 20 megahertz channel. Maybe I should try it on a 20 megahertz channel. So it switches over to 20 megahertz channel, repackages it, 64 qualm, 3 of 4 coding, 20 megahertz channel with short guard interval, ping, noack, ping, noack, ping, noack. Huh, that didn't work. Let's try it all the way to the bottom. BPSK, 1 of 2 coding, 20 megahertz channel, long guard. Ping, ack. And on the user's interface, it goes, we're good. <laughs> Ping does not tell you about the health of your RF. We use it in wired world all the time because uh, Ping's like, tells me the truth. In wireless, it doesn't. So I need to know what the MCS is. Other thing I can do is I can compare throughputs. I can compare what's the AP offering versus what am I getting? If the AP is offering 560 and I'm only getting 110, why? Now, if the reason was I'm at a current MCS 7, but I'm only one spatial stream, and the AP is offering two spatial streams, that's an environmental issue. I don't think I can fix, you know, unless I go and put, like, lots of metal in the room, cause more reflections to fix a spatial stream issue. So if it's a spatial stream issue or your boss has an old phone that's only one spatial stream, he's never going to get the max speed. I need to check my RSSI and SNR from both sides. I can go in the controller and it can say, I see this client at this, but I kind of also need to know what does the controller say, what the client say on, on the back side. And is it isolated? Is it me? Is it everyone on this floor? Is it anyone who's attached to a single AP? Is it anyone who's on this SSID? So I can use the same tools to find out where is this problem? Now we developed a four day troubleshooting course built on these concepts. And you know what, after four days, we don't teach you how to troubleshoot anything. But we do teach you how to use the tools whether they be, sorry, let me flip down. Oh, I went too far, sorry. What we do teach you out of that time is to use the techniques to find the problem. Is it one of these 4 and 27 things? And for that problem, which tool do I use to find out what it is? If you like this idea and you wanted to get copies of these, without Michael taking pictures and then scaling them off <laughs> and then cutting them out and sharing them, uh, you, you can just go to this site, <laughs> uh, wmpros.com slash troubleshooting, and all the slides are there. Um, take all you want. They're there to share and do what you want to do. Uh, the, the point is information should be free. Share it around, and thank you very much. for Keith. I have seven minutes left and you have lunch, so. Does anyone want to get in the way of us and lunch? A oh, one person does. They, they are downloadable. I just gave you the site. Who, well, whoever asked the question. Any other questions? It's really hard, wmpros.com slash troubleshooting. Oh, no, I, I was just going to ask that, that slide you had at the very beginning about CPRS. Could you, uh, put that, could you put that slide up? I wanted to see the link to that. Oh, I can. Let's see if they can do it. If, if no one else has slide IDOs, I can put so it on So backstage, here. we'll need to switch back to Keith's laptop. Any other questions? Keith, do you just want to tweet that link maybe? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, I will do that as well. Maybe we could just it's write it down. It's a big long link. Yeah. It's uh, what wireless land engineers need to know about CBRS. So maybe we'll tweet that out. How's yeah, that sound? That's, that's a, a, a little longer. Yeah, question. They didn't tell me that I'd have to run around everywhere.
Uh, in regards to troubleshooting, what would you, what advice would you give to someone who's newer to um, becoming a WLAN pro? Learn how the protocol works. Oh, here's another one. As you just here, everyone is a CWAP. Stand up. What? If you're a CWAP, stand up. Okay. If you're not a CWAP, that's the first step. Now to get a C, oh, thank you. Uh, to, to answer your question, yeah, I do. It's to, so you got lunch soon, just to get it all. CWNA, CWAP, I think that's the order they should go in, because if you know AP, then you know everything else, the rest of them are really easy. Understand how the protocol works, that's how you're going to troubleshoot. If you don't know, hey, my, my, my grandpa was a mechanic, he worked forever, and worked on big stuff, aircraft, everything, and he would walk up to someone and put his hand on it and goes, yeah, I think this is a problem, and he would fix something. And once a factory rep comes and goes, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know, just the last time this thing did it, I did this to fix it. And he goes, we haven't had that problem in our engines for 25 years. Why are you still doing that? And he goes, well, I thought that's what fixed it. So if you don't know what you're doing, you can do all sorts of crazy things. And then you, you get this problem. I call it the, um, I don't know how to say this nicely. I said I won't say it nicely. It, it's a problem that some sites on the internet that have forums have where somebody says, I put an AP up, I did this with it, it worked. And so then they tell all their friends, and then they tell all their friends, and then everyone points at that going, yeah, that's the way you're supposed to do it. And you're like, no, it's not. It worked because Wi-Fi is robust, not because you put the AP in the wrong position, hid it under a basket with this little thing. You need to understand how it works. If you understand how it works, everything else comes after that. So Keith, question from the audience. What's the craziest Wi-Fi problem you've encountered? <laughs> that I can tell you? <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Someone sent me in a private jet to Dubai to diagnose that their VLAN was off by one digit. And then, then when I fixed it in something like 30 seconds, they went, uh, thanks for fixing our Wi-Fi. <laughs> and like, there's the door. Like, I flew all the way here, and that was it? Well, yeah, you solved it for us. I'm like, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I went to the mall. I went to the place where you can ski in Dubai, just so you can do it. Terrible skiing, by the way. I mean, coming from Utah, that was not really skiing. How much self-control did it take for you to not say, but the Wi-Fi was working great. The Wi-Fi was working perfectly. Uh, it takes no self-control because that's exactly what I said. I didn't fix your Wi-Fi. Anything else? All right, perfect. Let's give lunch. it up for Keith. <laughs>